Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Airplane Anatomy. In this series, I break down different airplanes from their history to their engineering to how they fly. So today in episode eight, we're going to be talking about an airplane that probably not very many of you are familiar with, despite the fact that without this plane, many modern airliners might not even exist, and that is the de Havilland Comet, which was the very first jet airliner in the world and also a pioneer in many different ways. So for example, it led to the introduction and widespread spread use of pressurized cabins and hydraulic flight controls and many more in commercial airplanes. So in many ways, the development of the comets single-handedly changed the course of commercial aviation history. So now you might be wondering, well then why haven't I heard very much about these de Havilland planes or the comets? Uh, shouldn't it be like the Boeing 737 or the Airbus A320? Well, not quite, because despite its success, the Comet actually went out of service just one year after its initial introduction and essentially served as the guinea pig to development of modern airliners. So today in this video, we're going to break down the history of the Comet and also the incredible engineering that went to its groundbreaking designs and also talk about what important lessons it taught us that actually still shape the course of aviation even today. So let's get started. Development of the Comet began in the 40s, and this was a time where air travel was very different than what it is today. Back then, it was supposed to be this luxurious experience that was only able to be afforded by the very upper class. But despite its steep price tag, the experience itself was horrible. These planes were actually converted from World War II bombers that were designed for, well, bombs and not passenger comfort. They were powered by these huge propellers that were not only extremely loud, but also caused very violent violent vibrations in the cabin. So on top of that, the plane also couldn't fly very far or very high. So as opposed to flying over bad weather and turbulent areas as we would today, these planes back then had to fly right through them. And all of this was due to one limiting factor, and that was the propeller-driven engines. Engineers actually realized that they couldn't improve these engines any further, since as the blade tips approached the speed of sound, their efficiency was actually quickly decreasing. So they had no other option than to look for an alternative engine and this was the jet engine, or specifically the gas turbine engine. Now, jet engines were already being experimented on many different aircrafts in the 40s. However, most of them were on fighter airplanes. At that time, people believed that jet engines were way too expensive and consumed too much fuel to be even viable for commercial airplanes. Hence, no company wanted to invest in a jet airliner and instead wanted to stick to the propeller-driven airplanes that worked well enough. Well, that is, except for a British airplane manufacturer by the name of de Havilland. Now, de Havilland wanted a slice in the aerospace monopoly that American companies held in commercial aviation. And they also believed that a jet airliner was going to revolutionize commercial aviation, and they were right. So in 1943, development on the very first de Havilland Comets began. engineers realized that the jet engines were much more efficient at higher altitudes. For example, at 10,000 feet, the jet engines actually consumed three times more fuel than it would cruising at 30,000 feet. However, this posed a new problem for the engineers, and that was the lack of oxygen, since most cabins at that time were not pressurized. This meant that the air inside the cabin needed to mimic the air pressure at around 8,000 feet while being surrounded by much lower pressure air outside. And at the same time, because because of the additional power of these jet engines, the Comet was expected to travel much further. This meant that it would be subject to a much wider range of different temperatures and climates. Now, both of these factors combined stressed out the airframe of the Comet much more than any other airplane at that time. Now, this perhaps foreshadowed events to come. Now, engineers also decided to embed the engines called the de Havilland Ghost Engines within the wing, as opposed to a prodded engine design that we typically see today. Now, this was mainly to reduce drag, but at the same time, reduce the risk of flying foreign objects into the engine. 
And also, this made it easier for engineers to place noise-reducing material around the engines to increase passenger comfort. Now, of course, the trade-off to this was that it added weight and complexity to the wings, had to be reinforced as a result. Now, at one point, two booster rockets were actually added to the Comet in order to help it with takeoff in hot climates and high altitudes. However, after extensive testing, engineers actually found that it was unfortunately not necessary. So in 1949, under the watchful eye of the entire world, the very first prototype of the comet took to the skies for the very first time. And just three years later, in 1952, the comet entered service officially. The very first commercial flight of the Comet was from London to Johannesburg in a speedy 23-hour flight and making five stops on the way. Now this doesn't sound very fast for today's standards, but at that time, the Comet was already twice as fast as any of its other piston engine competitors. Now not to mention that the Comet was much more comfortable to fly in with a very quiet cabin and reduced turbulence. Now although the length of the Comet was nearly the same as a Boeing 737 today, it only carried around 44 passengers, since every single seat was basically a first-class seat with tons of legroom. Now remember, air travel was still a luxury back then. There were many systems on the Comet that were completely new to civil aviation at that time. For example, having hydraulic flight controls as opposed to physical attachments, or something called irreversible power controls, which prevented aerodynamic forces from actually pushing on the aircraft and physically changing flight control surfaces. However, it wasn't all great news for the Comets, because for example, although there were four hydraulic systems for redundancy, they actually were so often faulty in the beginning that pilots had to carry hydraulic fluid on every flight in case a top-up was needed. And also the electronic systems and avionics would often get overheated and sometimes even the cockpit windows would get fogged up. But so far these were all just small details and the Comet continued to receive love and praise in 1952 and 1953 and orders rolled in from around the world. That is until the incident started. In January of 1954, a BOAC, now British Airways flight, took off from Rome, headed for London. And after just 20 minutes into the flight, the plane exploded mid-air. Now, of course, all the comets were grounded immediately and an investigation was launched. Now, although this crash led to the redesign of 60 different components on the comets, the investigators actually weren't able to find an exact cause for the accident. Hence, all of the comets were put back into service. However, just three months after the accident, in April of 1954, the same thing happened again. And this time, the comets were once again grounded and its airworthiness certificates were taken away and the British government actually intervened. The Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, said that the comet mystery was to be solved at all costs in an attempt to repair the image of the British aerospace industry. Initial autopsy reports of the victims revealed that the cause of death was violent decompression, which pointed to failure of the fuselage. So to test this theory, investigators decided to fill in a fuselage with water, sealing it in, then submerging the fuselage in a large tank of water. Then they vary the pressure repeatedly inside of the cabin to simulate a pressure change during flight. Now, even though the plane was originally designed to tolerate over 40,000 flight hours at the equivalent of around only 9,000 flight hours simulated, the engineers noticed that there was a sharp decline in cabin pressure and noted that there was a large gash in the fuselage that stemmed from one of its large rectangular windows. Now, we have finally solved the mystery of the comet. With rectangular windows, the stress on the airframe became concentrated at its corners. So over time, these additional stresses created tiny little fractures in the metal that grew bigger and bigger and eventually just blew the whole thing apart. Now this is also known as metal fatigue, which was a topic that was not very well understood back then. This is of course why today we only see airplane windows that are round. Now, with the discovery of the critical structural failure of the Comet, all were pulled from service and De Havilland went on to recreate the plane called the Comet 2, then the Comet 3, then the Comet 4 with oval windows and reinforced airframes. And finally, the Comet 4 was first delivered in 1958, four years after the initial Comet's accident. However, the damage to the reputation of the Comet was already done since many airlines were pulling out of their orders completely and passengers were also losing faith in the plane. 
plane. But at the same time, across the pond, Boeing saw the demonstrated success of these jet airliners and decided to invest into a program to eventually build their Boeing 707, marking the beginning of a commercial jet era. And many companies around the world were doing the same. So soon, the sales of the Boeing 707 and many of these jet airliners began to exceed that of the Comets. And so in 1997, the Comet 4 took its very last flight. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. Now, admittedly, the Comet really has a special place in my heart because I think it deserves a lot more credit than it gets these days. So I'm really happy to have shared this episode with you guys. Now, as always, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and also uh, subscribe to my channel for new great aviation content. And as always, I will see you soon.